But we see our national leaders, Cheney, for example, just last week uh, when confronted with the poll numbers showing that 70 percent of the people opposed the Iraq war, his answer was, so? Uh, which means there's a complete disdain for the uh, opinions of the American people. Um, but at this point, uh, the question of civil liberties has been so distorted and, uh, and the creation of this other. So we have to worry about the laws being abused against someone else, not with respect to ourselves, has caused people to think less clearly, I think, about what the real issues are when they're confronted with the war, when they're conf in Iraq, when they're confronted with the Bear Stearns and the collapse of the economy, um, and the uh, idea that the greatest threat to our liberties actually is our own government is an idea that, uh, of course, is part of our founding uh, principles, but uh, not well articulated by either party today. Well, uh, when you say you know, Dick Cheney said so, and I, I think I share your disappointment and revulsion of that response, yet can we absolve the civil rights movement and the, uh, and the democratic forces so easily and say they are just sort of you know, outsmarted by the other side? And isn't there a failure on our part to build a national uh, movement and to give it a national name and a national face? Well, they're, they're, I can't answer that question fully, and uh, Sean, I'm sure, has, has additional things to add. But yes, it is true that, that's, uh, that there has been a, a lack of grassroots activism uh, fighting this. But um, as I've mentioned on other occasions, there's a, a quote from a national leader that I often use. And he said, well, of course, the ordinary people don't want war, but it's not up to them. Uh, first, you tell them that there's a threat. Uh, then you uh, uh, attack the pacifists for being disloyal, and you can do anything you want. And that was uh, Herman Goring in the 1946 war crimes trials. And he was merely echoing Machiavelli. And uh, the idea that a foreign enemy or the threat that is this inchoate threat can be used to manipulate a populace is an old, old trick. And the only way to fight that is for the populace itself to, uh, to be educated and to take action. Uh, but so far, the war on terrorism has been extremely successful in creating the impression that, uh, that the government needs to operate without limit. I also think, though, that it reflects a lack of faith that particularly the Democratic Party has in the American people. Because I think if you really bring these issues straight to the American people, they will respond. The average person does not want to be wiretapped. The average person does not want a war without end. The average person does not want a government that prosecutes people on secret evidence. The average person does not want a trial in which the lawyers don't see the evidence or people are locked up as enemy combatants. They want a fair system, something that they can be proud of, something that they know is fair for their neighbors, for themselves. And if they actually look at this stuff and the politicians present it, I think that they would actually back mm -hmm. them even stronger than they do now. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it's, it's cowardice in many ways. Yes. And w would you say that in some cases people are not able to respond to these things because they don't know about it? They don't have a clear understanding of what's going on with different people. It's, it's just not, you know, I, when I ask my students in the classroom of different things, for instance, this, uh, is it 1955, mm -hmm. 1955? People didn't have a clue about that. And then I ask is how is it that you can be going to a reasonably decent university and don't have the clue about important issues in your own life? That, I think, partly is the issue that we need to address. And given the fact that there are such success stories like mover.org, who is not able to raise monies and inform people, why is it that the civil rights movement has not been able to create a version of moveron.org for themselves? I can't, I can't really explain it. There's, in many ways, probably higher levels of political activism now in this country than there was 30 years ago. I mean, you have young people that are involved, that are blogging, that are doing online petitions, that are doing consciousness raising. There are older uh, people who have been doing this stuff for 30, 40, 50 years, and they all come together. There were you know, thousands, thousands, and thousands of people who protested the war, and still do. But there is that gap that we do see as far as what is going on on the ground in public opinion and what's presented in the media, and then getting over the hump as far as a politician who will actually be that vessel um, for that popular opinion. And it, it's a tough question. There are obviously many um, economic interests that like to keep the status quo the status quo. Well, uh, excuse me, but I, it, it seemed to me that I, I agree with what Sean said, but it, 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 and it, I want to expand on it a bit. There, there, it seems to me there are three things that are somehow interrelated. One is that there is just plain uh, uh, information and issue exhaustion. There have been so many 
attacks on civil liberties. They've been coming so quickly, they've been one after the other, that it's hard to even keep track of them. I, that's my job to study these, and it's hard for me to keep track. This bill that you mentioned, 1955, I wrote one of the few pieces uh, critical of the bill, mm -hmm. saying that it was creating a new House on Medi American Activities, a new HUAC. There's been very little publicity about it. Um, uh, but there've been, there's been so many issues that it's one of, of many. Then we have a, a culture that has been, uh, where individual issues have been emphasized more. And when we talk about the YouTube generation and uh, individualization being the wave of the future, it's very difficult for people who don't have an analysis to develop it because everything is turned inward. And then we have the, uh, the problem, at least with respect to Iraq, that in the absence of the draft, uh, most people aren't touched directly by the war. And then Cheney, as he also said in that same interview, well, they're all volunteers, so we don't care what happens to them. And it's, it's someone else's problem in the way it, it seems to be conceptualized. And it's very difficult for people living their ordinary lives daily to conceive of these attacks being attacks on them, which of course they are, but uh, that's, uh, that's the uh, beauty of uh, divide and conquer and, and uh, creating diversions that uh, keep us from talking about the central Since issues. Since both of you are civil rights attorneys, what has been your experience vis-a-vis -vis the media and the academia? Like I think you did an event yesterday also at a local campus. So what's your experience in terms of the role of the media and the academia in terms of maintaining some vigilance regarding civil liberties? Well, I think it's been a, a very difficult role with the media. I represent, my firm represents a number of people who have been charged with terrorism counts. In this country, if you're charged with anything, you're supposed to be presumed innocent. Obviously, unfortunately, that's not what happens. The first thing you see is a picture splattered across the paper or on the news, terrorism, terrorists, Al-Qaeda, Taliban, and then basically uh, objective, quote unquote, vitriol hurled at the person, despite the fact that it's presumed innocent, and uh, despite the fact that many times after a number of months, the charges will be shown to be flimsy. But you can't take back that initial splash that occurs, and that's something that we see in all of these cases, just the, the immediate jump to sensationalism and branding the person as a terrorist. And as a defense lawyer, you have to deal with the jury pool then that has gone through this, been infected with this over and over, case after case, and to try to undo that in the limited time you have in one criminal trial is a daunting, daunting task. Now, in terms of your own uh, involvement with Professor Sammy's case, mm -hmm. tell me how you've seen the media sort of, you know, responses and reactions and coverage, fairness or lack thereof, and where is he right now? What's the status of his uh, Struggle. And we're talking about Dr. Samuel Arian. Yes. Well, as, as you and, and perhaps some of your um, viewers know, Samuel Arian was accused of being the largest financier for terrorism in the Middle East uh, and arrested uh, in 2005 in February, or 2003 okay. rather, in February. And John Ashcroft had a press conference in, in Moscow uh, accusing him of uh, all of this, these financial uh, uh, dealings. Um, he was then held in solitary confinement for a year and a half in supermax-like uh, conditions. Um, and then there was a six-month trial in which the government produced 80 witnesses, um, uh, excerpts from 425,000 FISA-recorded communications, uh, 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 phone conversations, videotapes of violence in the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera. And his defense lawyers presented a defense of saying, um, everything he did was protected by the First Amendment. They offered no evidence, no uh, testimony, uh, and these 12 jurors in Tampa who had been exposed to this, this uh, propaganda uh, came back and said that he was not guilty. He's, however, still in prison. And what has happened, uh, the, the, the artful work of the lawyers in that case and the fact that the trial went on so long meant that there was enough time for them to, uh, to offset that propaganda and for them to begin to think independently. And when that happens, a jury can be a wonderful thing because they can say, stop to the government. In this case, they did. But then the government, both the judge in the case and then the Justice Department, subverted the jury trial by manipulating the grand jury and the sentencing so that Dr. Arian, Dr. Alarian is still in jail today, two years, more than two years after being uh, acquitted. Um, 
two years after the Justice Department promised to release him in uh, May of 2006.